Hello, everyone. Welcome to AMA's December virtual conference, MarTech, Automation and AI. We hope you've enjoyed the session so far today, and we hope you'll continue to enjoy the sessions before the end of the day. Don't forget to tune back in to our last session of the day, beginning just after this one at 1255, as we will announce the winners of this conference's game live at that session. My name is Megan Kane, and I'm an event manager with the American Marketing Association. I'm so pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's session, Generative Marketing, Bring Generative AI to Your Entire Marketing Stack in 2024. This session is brought to you by Growth Loop. Before our session today, I would like to go over a few features in the event platform that will help you get the most out of this session and your whole virtual conference experience. You'll notice on the right-hand side of the page, you'll see a chat box and a Q&A box. You can use the attendee chat to network and talk with any other attendees throughout the entirety of the session. You can use the Q&A to ask any questions you may have of the speakers or the Growth Loop team. With that, I am pleased to welcome today's speakers, Chris Sell and Anthony Rotio. Chris is the co-founder and CEO of Growth Loop, and Anthony is the Chief Data Strategy Officer. Please welcome Chris and Anthony. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is Anthony Rodeo. We're here with Chris Sell to talk about generative marketing and how you can bring generative AI to your entire marketing stack in 2024. Thanks for having me today, Anthony. Excited to chat. Thanks for coming. Now, Chris, this is the awkward part where we throw our faces up and give little introductions. So I'll give you the honors of going Lovely. first. Lovely. I'm Chris Sell. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Growth Loop. Previously, I was a marketer at Google about 10 years ago and went through a lot of the pains of the marketing technology stack. So I decided to create Growth Loop about six years ago and excited to chat to you about how it's leading to generative marketing. Anthony Rodeo, I'm our Chief Data Strategy Officer. I was also a marketer previously at a beer company called Anheuser-Busch. And prior to that, I had my computer science degree and then decided to go work in beer for a while. So Chris, maybe to get started, if you could tell, since you know Growth Loop is not a Google or an Anheuser-Busch in terms of scale and awareness, you know, quite yet. Maybe we could start if you gave a little bit of background uh, to the folks who, who haven't really heard of us or, or know much. Yeah, about us. quick context and why we exist. So as I mentioned, I was in ads marketing at Google and I actually did email marketing. And in my job, we had a bunch of data sitting in a great data stack, internal version of BigQuery. And my job was to cross sell, upsell our customers for the first 180 days and try to get them to understand our products and spend a bit more money by using email, push notification, and SMS. And what I realized in that experience is it's actually much more difficult than it sounds. And in a large part, it was because of the marketing technology that we use. So I always remember going to my boss and saying, hey, I have 20 different journey ideas that I want to run this year in order to do my job. And he's like, well, why don't you go try to run one and see how that goes and use our marketing technology stack to get it done. So about six weeks later, I come back to him. He's like, how's it going? I said, well, I'm 40% of the way through running that first use case. And he's like, well, welcome to marketing. So that's why we started Growth Loop was maybe a marketer should actually be able to run all 20 and technology should get out of the way. So we started Growth Loop about six years ago. We're about 100 employees. We're out of Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Toronto. And uh, we work with several top brands. Think of major retailers like Kohl's. Think of major technology companies like Indeed and Google major media and entertainment companies like NASCAR, the Big Ten, Chicago Cubs, et cetera. So really the, what we're trying to help folks do is actually make data useful to marketers. And generative AI is part of that story. Generative AI is going to transform how marketers can leverage data and actually run those 20 journeys that my young whippersnapper self could not do. I wanted to start today talking about something that actually I, one of my stories here from when I was a marketing director is I remember writing these great integrated marketing communications briefs, right? We would spend time getting these briefs like to perfection in terms of the insight, the target audience, what we want our audiences to think, feel, and do. And then our agencies would produce this phenomenal work. And then when it came time to let the rubber hit the road and actually try to get this into action in a coherent way across all channels that our customers would kind of understand stand and feel like they're getting coherent messaging that might actually drive them or encourage them to take some action, cross-channel is really hard. And Chris, maybe you could talk a little bit about why that's the case and some redundancy in the MarTech stack that, that 
that we could start try to help folks out. Yeah, I, I know there's going to be a lot of marketers listening to this and everybody that's done marketing knows this problem. Marketing technology is a set of siloed systems, meaning every single channel, you're essentially organized around channel today. Every system you use usually does one or two channels well. So you have something for email, you have something for push notification, you have something for SMS, you have something for sales CRM, you have it for pay ads and social, and you actually orient your entire teams around each channel. And then you have a piece of technology and the email system where you have a database. You have a way to build audiences. So now you have all these different teams storing data in these different systems, creating audiences and segments of your customers in those different systems. And then none of those systems talk to each other or can orchestrate. So how are you supposed to run a cross-channel campaign to a consistent audience? It's actually impossible. And so a lot of organizations just give up and they just say like, hey, you know what? You just do email, just do it well. And the, the bigger problem here is not only are you creating a disjointed customer experience because none of the systems talk to each other, you're actually creating a ton of redundant cost across your organization. Because if you think about it, you're storing data 10 times in 10 different systems. And guess how all of these systems charge? They charge you by how much data they hold. So they love it. They're saying, okay, yeah, store more data in my system, copy it everywhere, and I'll charge you 10 times what you should be paying. And then you have all these teams, analytics teams in marketing, responsible to actually try to stitch the data between all the systems your marketers are doing. So think about it, you're paying full-time employees to literally just stitch data together between all these systems and a futile effort to try to bring some coordination to your marketing. And so in order to, if you bring generative AI into this situation, you're just going to have more of a silo problem. You're going to have generative AI for email working off different segments. You're going to have generative AI for push notification working off different segments. And so generative AI has the potential to actually exacerbate this problem of the silo issue if you don't do it right. Yeah, I think we have a pretty talented marketing team that was able to make this look very like nice and pretty. But when it comes down to it in the trenches, what we've seen with some customers for their architecture diagrams, you see like point to point syncs between systems. You see data source going to three or four different systems without any identity resolution in between. You see spaghetti diagrams where there's just lines everywhere between everything. When really, when you peel that back, it ends up being a lot of times like some really talented, overworked analysts writing a bunch of SQL and uploading CSV files everywhere, right? And it's like, that leads to a ton of, uh, you know, inaccurate data in these systems for the marketers. It leads to latency and redundancy, right? You get stale data and none of the systems talk to each other. And it's not for lack of trust trying on anyone's part, right? Like everyone gets frustrated in this situation. The marketers get frustrated. The analyst gets frustrated. The customer gets frustrated because it feels like you don't know them. And then the company gets frustrated because you leave all these conversions on them. It's a pretty tough situation to break out of once you're actually in it for a while. Yeah. We established a problem here. We're not going to wrap here and, and tell everyone have a great day. What are we going to do about it, Chris? It's actually just impossible to bring. That's where we're going to end it. It's impossible to bring AI to your MarTech stack. It's all siloed and it's not going to happen. Just kidding. The way you can do this we call it the new age of composable marketing. So what is composable marketing? And how do you make this easy to do in your organization? So composable marketing technology is a way to say, there's been two paths to get out of the marketing technology silo problem. You can either choose to go with an all-in-one solution. And the all-in-one solutions we all know are these platforms where you have you pay a boatload of money, you have different modules. What it creates is it says you have to put all of your data in that system and you can only use the channels that are available within that system. Meaning your innovation roadmap is completely locked in to whatever that company does. So cost in lock-in become the issue of all-in-one platforms. And to date, that's been the only solution for the silo problem. And so marketing technologists and VPs of marketing are put in this tough situation of you're telling me to solve the silo problem problem, I have to go with an all-in-one solution. Is that the right move for the organization long-term? And they usually have a spidey sense that maybe it's not because they have no flexibility. So here enters a new solution and it's called composable marketing technology. And what composable marketing technology started out with is organizations started to bring in a new data layer that would work across their marketing channels. So to start, they would say, hey, what am I going to use for marketing analytics? And that's typically 
a Google BigQuery, a Snowflake, Redshift, Databricks. And that's where your analysts are actually measuring campaigns. And what this has done is it started to create a unified data layer of where a lot of your customer data is sitting. And because that's being extracted from each of the marketing technology silos, it's creating a ton of opportunities to do marketing technology in a completely new way. That gives you flexibility while also giving you centralized control of the data. And so what we're starting to see in composable marketing technology is actually key capabilities are being extracted from the channel tools and those silos and put right on top of this enterprise data layer. So this is things like creating audience segments. Your marketers, no matter what channel they're using, they should probably be creating audience segments in a central place. In terms of orchestrating across the channels, wouldn't it make sense to do that straight from your single source of truth and your unified data layer and start to orchestrate exactly, Anthony, for the use case you were saying, target people that haven't opened emails on paid media. That would make sense to do from a central location. Experimentation, instead of doing measurement in my 10 different marketing channel tools, what if I was actually able to measure experiments directly from my own database? And then this is where you start to open up the possibility of using generative AI outside of a silo, which we'll get into. Now, what this starts to create, if you put these components in place in your marketing technology stack, you can start to actually swap out the channels you use. You have the ultimate flexibility because let's say today you're using email through Braze, you're doing notifications through Salesforce Marketing Cloud, you're doing paid media through Google Ads, and you're doing events through Hopin as a platform. Well. Tomorrow, you can decide, well, you know what? I want to try the latest push notification tool or conversational chat tool. And I can allow my marketers to do that and bring the audiences and the data that we already have at our data layer to orchestrate with that new tool. So it gives you the flexibility while you have centralized control. And I think that's the power of the composable marketing technology stack. It's this new alternative to the all-in-one platform. Yeah, one of the things I think is super interesting there that you brought up, Chris, is um, the idea of kind of like vendor lock in. And, you know, a lot of these systems built to their own data layer, not because they were trying to like aggregate your your first party data. And it was because these cloud systems didn't exist when a lot of these folks popped up. But now what's possible when you factor that out and give your, you know, your marketers the place to build once and use everywhere, you can really free your MarTech stack. And you can, that means not only swapping out vendors, but also all of these artifacts, these audiences, these journeys the all the metadata associated with your experiments, your treatment control labels, your aggregated metrics, all this stuff is available in your data cloud for your data teams who are probably very strong, right? And they're already doing a lot of this work and wish they had access to these systems. A lot of times they'll be downloading and extracting from these systems and trying to put pieces together. Instead, you get a lot of the openness out of the box just by like pulling back and factoring out the commonalities across these systems in one place where your teams can really own them. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the thing I like about this as well is you can unlock capabilities without having to do an 18 month migration project. So what I, when I'm talking to a lot of VPs of marketing, they're like, when they come into the job, they're like, well, you know, do I migrate my entire MarTech stack before I drive value because I want to unlock the capability to do cross-channel journeys? They have a, a tough bargain to make. They have to say, I want to move to an all-in-one platform, but that's going to take me 18 months. So I won't be able to launch journeys for 18 months. Now I need to prove value in my first three months on the job. So do I just scrap that project and try to use the current stack? And so with this type of approach, the answer is you can use the current stack and bring journeys to it. So you can start to centralize the data and then build audiences and journeys from a central location, but orchestrate with the current tools. So if I'm a VP of marketing, I come in and say, okay, where's our enterprise data layer? Do we have BigQuery? Do we have Snowflake? Great. I'm going to put an orchestration layer on top of that. And I'm going to orchestrate with what we currently have. So if I have Salesforce Marketing Cloud and I want to move to Adobe Campaign, great. I can move to Adobe Campaign whenever I want to, but right now I'm going to orchestrate journeys between Salesforce Marketing Cloud and Facebook ads today. And then I'm going to swap in Adobe Campaign whenever I want to. So I can drive value short term while still getting to the tools I love long term. All right. Let's talk a little bit about once you kind of establish this composable marketing and composable MarTech foundation, how AI fits into this stack. And one of the things before we even get 
to the AI silo problem that I want to talk about is we have this great use case that we've seen with a lot of our customers like Mercari US, for example, where they have great data science teams that are that are building predictions today, right? More traditional machine learning based predictions, churn propensity scores, uh, lifetime value predictions, and just being able to inject them once in this composable stack and use them everywhere across all their platforms is very high value. And a lot of the data teams challenges, data science teams challenges isn't, hey, I need to tweak three or four more percent out of my, you know, the, the my performance of my predictive model. What I need to do is get this thing off the shelf and into action for all of my teams so they can actually use it. Yeah, and I was going to add it's a, it's a hundred percent a delivery problem. Yes. Yes. That's a hundred percent right. And th that actually like th that learning that we had with a bunch of our customers was, I think, a great foundation for us to realize that it's, it's fairly similar when you think about generative, generative AI and how to apply it and where to apply it. I think there's, there's three reasons why, um, you know, this composable, this composable layer on the data cloud is the right place to apply it. And the first one has to do with data, right? This is going to be the place where you have the most of your customer data, the most data from your enterprise, all the context. And anyone who's ever played with a large language model knows without good context, whether that's through just, you know, injecting it into the prompt, retrieval based generation, whether it's through fine tuning without enough data or context, you're not going to get to an enterprise level of prediction that you can actually use. So being on the foundation of all the data is a, is a superpower for these. That's the question I have for you, Anthony, is like, there's two approaches. I could just flip every tool in the marketing stack right now is launching AI features. So if I'm, you know, the CEO is asking the CMO right now, what are we doing in AI? And then I have a bunch of software today where I could just go flip on their latest AI widget. That's, you know, I don't know what it's going to do. It's going to write my copy, for example, for emails versus like, does that create a siloed approach like it does with audiences or journeys or is that the right move because it unlocks value fast yeah i think one there was very one one very specific thing you said in there which is uh what are we doing in ai and you see two different types of ceos today you see the ones that ask what are we doing in ai and kind of more savvy ones that are saying what is our generative ai strategy and like activating generative ai in one channel and producing some creative there is a, a good answer to what are we doing in ai that is not the place to build a generative AI strategy. Your generative AI strategy should be one-to-one -one with your data strategy. And if you don't have a solid data foundation, your generative AI strategy is going to be fairly weak. Now, that's not to say that a lot of the, the tools that are being produced in platform and in these channels aren't remarkable and shouldn't be used. But there's a lot that you can do centrally on these objects, right? On these audiences, on these journeys, with these experiments centrally that you can use across all of your channels. And that's the second point is the benefit of the composable stack where you can generate audiences, get suggestions, generate journeys and use them everywhere, right? So you can iterate on them with the generative AI. You get some suggestions, you tweak them, and then you can put them into action across your channels with the context actually, you know, of all the data that's sitting underneath underneath these models centrally. The third piece that I think is, is honestly one of the most important is being able to keep pace with these like hyperscaler investments in generative AI, right? You don't have to be beholden to one of your channel's AI road maps, right? And you can take advantage of, for example, like Vertex AI's innovation pace centrally, or all the investments that like OpenAI is putting into its third-party APIs and apply that once centrally and use it everywhere across all channels. I think that's that's a key for enterprises that want to not just like put something out into the world that's going to be obsolete in six to 12 yeah. months, but be able to keep pace and, and apply these things in a place where they can keep pace with the largest folks who are investing the most money. Yeah, when innovation's so, happening this fast, you can actually use it as a component on your stack at the central layer before you orchestrate your marketing tools. It means you can bring your own LLMs, which they're a MarTech tool. So no offense, yeah, marketing technology. Sure. I don't think they're going to have thousands of AI engineers at a single company. And not to mention the like open source community out there. It's just, it's remarkable the pace that things are happening. Like the idea of, of change. That's actually a really good point. Yeah. Open, like you can't take advantage of open source in an all-in-one, but. That's, that's where like look for companies that are like applying these things generally and using kind of them in the context that's useful within the channel, but probably not doing a ton of, you know, if you see a company that is not at the scale of these companies, or maybe you, you haven't heard of a couple of years ago, that's coming out and saying, you know, we've bought a bunch of H100s and we're, we're training our own foundation model. It's going to be really tough for them to keep up right now with everything else that's, that's out there, especially given the open source base on top of all the, these large companies that are out there. Okay. So we want to apply AI at the central layer in the composable MarTech stack. So what does that look like? Yeah, that's right. I think I think when we think 
think about like harnessing the capabilities that are coming out of generative AI, you know, to do kind of like this very focused granularity improvement on the audiences, the journeys, the creative assets, the experiments, what that turns into is this hyper personalized context aware customer experience, right? You could take all of the context that you have about your customers, um, even just like injecting that into the prompt alongside what you actually want the foundation model to do can give you some very, you know, remarkable results in terms of personalization and being able to like hit the customer with a message that's appropriate for not only their history, but where they are right now, what channel they're in and what they're doing, right? So that brings us to what we call the growth loop. And Chris, I'll let you kind of start to walk us through here and I'll jump in. I'll jump in where Yeah. So, I mean, the beauty of if you apply generative AI at, as a component to your marketing technology stack and the same philosophy we're talking about by breaking down marketing technology silos, it all starts in the exact same way. You have the universal data layer, which is big query Snowflake, Redshift, or Databricks. You have an orchestration layer or a composable CDP on top of it. That is what centralizes your audiences, your journey orchestration, as well as your measurement of the audiences. So they do not reside in the end channels. At that point, you control your destiny. You can swap out different marketing channels as new innovative ones come online. You control audiences across your global organization, no matter if there's 15 teams in different countries, you can see all the audiences in a central location. So you're in a really good spot at that point. But then from there, the question is, how do you apply generative AI? And I like to think about it as applying it where you bring your own AI engine. So let's say you want to use Palm from Google AI for your email text generation. You want to use MidJourney for your creative generation because you want to do it in a Renaissance format, Renaissance paintings. Uh, you bring Anthropic nice. for another use case internally in marketing. You have WPP or an agency build out a a customized LLM for your marketing team. It should not matter where that intelligence comes from. It should be able to plug in on top of this composable CDP layer. And the way we like to think about it is, what do you want to use for creating audiences to brainstorm with your marketers? What do you want to use to help your marketers brainstorm around what journeys they create? And what do you want them to use to generate creative that's on your brand tone and voice? Now, those could be three different models. And so what we do at Growth Loop is we have default models and we partnered with Google AI to provide those. So you have a way to generate conversations about audiences with your marketers so they can easily create them. You have a way to generate journeys and collaborate with them on how do you want to build an orchestrated journey for a specific goal. And then you can also bring your own creative LLMs where we have a default, but you can bring your own through Typeface or Jasper or an open source LLM to generate creative that's on your brand voice. And so it's still the same components. It's audience it's journeys, it's creative, but we allow you to have defaults, but then you can upgrade them and swap them in. And I think that's what gives you the flexibility. It gives you the ease to get started, but then it gives you the flexibility as the space explodes, which we're all seeing new things come online every other day. You can swap them in and just leverage them in the same framework on the same railroad that you've already created and the rails that you've laid. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I'm glad you mentioned it, Chris, because when you, when you think about like being able to bring your own, doesn't mean you have to bring your own. And that's one of the like key like philosophical tenets of the like composable mentality i would say is it should just work out of the box but if you want to upgrade it and you want to you want to plug different things in you should be able to do that too and that's that's kind of the mentality we've taken for you know for the last you know call it five six years in, in building the product that we built to this point and it's the same that you've been leading on the product side for now with the generative yeah. ai and then i think that we're it is what enables this composable marketing technology stack is the key question because it sounds difficult on the surface but really if you have a data database, which is your what we're calling the universal data layer here. The second component you need is something like growth loop or a composable CDP that is essentially enables you to slot in Legos. And those Legos are helpful in building audiences, building journeys and using AI to accelerate those things. And so our job as a product as the composable CDP is to allow you to bring in the Legos as quickly as you want to. It's a great analogy. My five year old loves Legos. I love Legos too. I you know, still do. So easy to get started with for folks, but also powerful enough where you could swap in and out your own tools and your own systems uh, on the back end if, if you choose to. Yeah, I think that's the thing to stress is imagine, you know, we're talking about composable marketing technology, but it's extremely easy to get started. So imagine you have your database, BigQuery, Snowflake, Redshift, Databricks, it doesn't matter. Now imagine this is the interface your marketers log into. And literally from an hour, it takes literally less than an hour to hook up to that database. And all of a sudden your marketer 
developers are able to brainstorm audiences with AI. And here we're using the power of Google's AI under the hood to allow you to literally have a chat-based interface to say, here's my goal, here's the types of customers I want to target. And we're generating audience ideas with your marketer, with collaborative AI. Now, let's say later down the road, you decide to build your own LLMs or bring in a different AI partner, you can slot that in and that's what would power this module. That's the Lego. You bring in your own Lego and that powers this module, but it's already set up. You have the chat-based interface and it's already running. And so what I love about this is from start to finish within an hour on your database, you now have centralized audience segmentation generated by AI. And I have the flexibility to swap in new AI whenever I want to. Yeah, that's one of the things I think is great about us using Vertex AI is kind of the default here is the model garden concept. Like whether you want to, you have enough data as an enterprise, you have a talented team, you want to in-house fine tune your own model for some of this stuff, or you want to work with a partner like Snorkel and build a bunch of synthetic data and fine tune your own model. You can bring those and it's really easy. Like it's an, it's an API swap out, right? In terms of like the endpoint that you're hitting or the model parameter that you're pushing there. So it's, it's pretty cool the way that we've, we've tried to factor this out and make it really helpful on day one, but flexible in terms of the level of your team and the experience that you have with, uh, with generative AI. And I'm using generative AI to create my audiences and I can sync those audiences across any of the marketing channels I use today. So the example I used up front, Anthony, was, hey, I'm using Salesforce Marketing Cloud today, but I want to switch to Adobe campaign. Imagine you could chat with the, the AI, create your audiences. Today, you're sending them to Salesforce Marketing Cloud, but as the VP of marketing, as soon as you sign that contract with Adobe campaign, you just send the audiences there. That's your transfer over. So that's the audience part. So now you have great a huge amount of flexibility and then you have extensibility if you go further in AI. The next step is creative. So the big thing everybody's excited about in generative AI is creative today. Well, when you have the audiences in a centralized location, you can use all of the context about the audience to generate channel creative. And so here we're showing an example of an integration we've done with typeface as our default to allow you to literally send your audience and create creative for any channel, email, push notification, SMS, as well as paid media media with a single click. Now, organizations are going to want to bring their own AI to this as well. Let's say you develop an LLM with an agency. You decide you want to use MidJourney to actually train your, do your creative, or you want to use other tools to do it. We allow you to swap those in. So when your marketers are clicking this lovely button here to say, hey, I want to generate creative, we'll leverage our default or you bring your own. I think this one, I want to tell a little story. I was in the room with Tamim when, you know, I think CTO Tamim at Dakar and, that, you know, there was this challenge where we, you know, we weren't passing, you know, enough useful data to Typeace, for example, to make the creative be super powerful. And it was just this epiphany moment where, well, we're sitting on top of literally the customer data. Like what if we just had an LLM summarize the metadata about this audience and use that in such a way to inform the creative to make it more personalized to the audience. And then, you know, it, it's just remarkable how quickly once you have the rails in place of, hey, we have an audience builder, hey, we have a creative engine, we have a partner with partnership with Typeface to be able to actually put that into practice practice and start to see results improve based on the, the makeup of the audience. So you get a, a more personalized message that you can use across across your channel. I thought that was a pretty cool, pretty cool moment in history. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this that's really the key second component. I mean, the third, this shows a few examples of the creative that can be generated, but really the third component is the learning here. So if you're going to start to measure, again, the third component is measure my audiences. Did any of this marketing work? And since you're sitting on that central data layer of your database, you can see every audience and every journey? What's the revenue lift? What's the lift in add to carts? What's the lift in logins? Any different engagement metric you're storing in your database, you can see the lift. Well, that becomes super valuable when you're bringing a LLM that's trying to suggest audiences and journeys for your marketing team to run. Because that means AI can see what's worked in the past. And if AI can see what's worked in the past, it can make better suggestions to your marketers in the future. So I think this is the big unlock long term is start with that first module, the marketers chatting with the AI about what audiences they want to target and why, what goals they're trying to hit. Well, now the AI can see what's worked in the past and say, hey, here's my suggestion and actually email the marketers ahead of time to say, hey, it looks like you still want, you want to solve the churn problem. I've identified another audience that might work for that to target. And so that's, I think, where this starts to get wild, where the marketers receiving suggestions and then getting better suggestions back when they're working with a collaborative AI. Yeah, this is the key. And this is where the loop comes in, right? Right. 
growth loop, when you can actually apply the learnings to make the suggestions better by default, like optimization by default, that unlocks kind of a new innovation pace with the team where you can just start to, you know, every time you do this, you start like one rung higher. On the yeah. Level. I mean, it's well, think about it this way. Like if you're a VP of marketing today, I used to always do this with my former email campaigns. We used to set up like literally repositories of what emails and their open rates to say, yes. to try to build a collective consciousness in our email marketing team to say, hey, do we all know what works and what's worked previously? Can we put this in a single repository and then have review sessions? So we're all going through them to actually the next creative we create with the agency or the next audience we target harks back to our learnings. Or are we just making it up every time? And that was a constant question in our, my team. And we tried our best to build this learning into the system. But exactly like you said, Anthony, this is learning by default. You're always yeah. building on what you did previously. And now your team can operate on a higher tier continually. You will continue to elevate your marketing because you can't otherwise. When you're having the chat with the AI, it will demand that you start to elevate the conversation based on what's worked previously. And that's what marketers want to do. All right. I want to make sure I play realist in the room here for sure. a second. Yeah. And I get a little bit I'm not gonna off throw, kilter. I'm not gonna throw, nope. I'm not going to throw a wet blanket. But I do want to point out for all the folks at home who are thinking like, yeah, okay, this is going to be some I'm feeling lucky button and AI generated stuff is just going to start firing out everywhere across all my channels. No, that's not the way this works. Chris used the term collaborative AI, which I think is really important. This builds drafts for you, right? And you as a user can go in and with very fine grained control in a, in a very marketer friendly UI, adjust the filters and the values and the operators that are being used to build your audience. You get to review everything before it ever goes live, right? Right? You're creative. You can iterate with that typeface integration if you don't like what you saw the first time. There's a review process in the platform, right? You could bring your brand teams, your legal teams to have to physically press a button before anything can ever go out the door. And a, a big part of that is a testament to the way Chris and the product team and the engineering team have designed this product based on our customer feedback, right? We work with some of the largest enterprises in the world and they don't want you know things to just fire out willy nilly across all channels. They need to have a human in the loop for this stuff, especially as we're learning learning and the models are improving. So I do want to point that out because we are talking yeah. about a lot of amazing features in the product, but it's important that a human is in the loop. at this. I point think that, that is the central tenet of generative marketing is one, can you create a composable system that allows you to slot in the Legos of innovation over time? But two, can you do it in such a way where marketers are in the loop at every single step? I imagine it like the marketer is a manager in an automotive plant looking down from the glass room. They need full transparency into everything every machine and every single process and be able to swap out the parts at each of those process and intervene at any of those steps so that the system operates as a whole. Now, what it means though, is they can produce the 20 journeys instead of one because they're not on the floor moving the parts from piece to piece every step of the way. And so that's the job of generative marketing is to build that type of situation for a marketer where they have control over every step and the models that are used at every single step. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris. You know, and you can see what's coming. We're not quite there yet, right? You go from one to many marketing across like a few channels. You go from one to one to one marketing, which is about where we are today. Like the future is probably going to be zero to zero marketing where you as a company your generative AI has to get through my personal generative AI for me to see anything. But now right? you're in trouble for we're getting too far ahead, Anthony. My point is we're not there yet. Like that's the, where we are today. A human needs to be in the loop. It's super helpful. And this is an accelerant for your existing teams. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I did get a little ahead there. Yeah. That's okay. We all do. All right. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the loop here, Chris. Creative learning. I think the key here is that every time you have a process, you know, take that manager on the automotive floor again. When the car gets completed at the end, what did you learn from the process? And what can you use to suggest better audiences and suggest better creative the next time based on your performance in the process and make sure you're learning over time. So we talked about how that gets bred into, hey, I can suggest a better audience to reduce churn. Well, I can also suggest suggest a better creative based on engagement rates over time as well. So default learning is the key piece of generative marketing that will be baked into the loop. And I think that really brings it end to end. If you think about generative marketing, think about composable marketing technology with Legos that you can slot in that gives you centralized control and the flexibility to innovate. You have marketers always in the loop at every step of the process, being able to control it, intervene, modify, and full transparency into what's happening in the system. And then three, you have constant learning by default. 
So as the marketers have new goals, it's baked in over time. And I think those three tenants really summarize the next trend of generative marketing. All right. So Chris, I want to thank you for joining me today and, uh, you know, giving me a chance to chat with you and chat with our viewers about generative marketing and how folks might be a little bit closer than they think they are to this composable MarTech foundation and being able to put generative AI into action across all their channels. Any, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think the beauty of this is like you said, Anthony, the key is to have a generative AI strategy for your marketing. And that strategy is going to, if you're thinking about the next five years, you want it to contain composable marketing stack where you can actually have the flexibility to innovate while you have centralized control. You want to have marketers in the loop at every single step in the process so that they're the ones that are feeling empowered to run 20 journeys instead of one that they can today. And you want constant learning to be baked in. You want a full loop for based on what you've done previously. Can you learn and get better over time? Can the AI make better suggestions? And while that sounds very grandiose, the key is in an hour, if you have a database internally as a VP of marketing, you can hook this up and get started with a composable CDP like Growth Loop and actually start to show your marketers what's possible while maintaining the ability to innovate in the future. So that's what I'd like to leave everybody with. And I appreciated your time as well, Anthony. Very well said. And thank you to all our viewers. You're probably only one step away from getting started with this. Please visit us at growthloop.com slash AMA. And I hope everybody has a really great day. Thanks.